This is Germany as we know it today, transformed into a place a lot of people would like to live in. How did they achieve their miraculous recovery? What did they know that we don't know? Early one Sunday morning, it was June 20th, 1948, the German Minister of Economics, Ludwig Herrhardt, a professional economist, simultaneously introduced a new currency, today's Deutschmark, and at one fell swoop, abolished almost all controls on prices and wages. Why did he do it on a Sunday morning? It wasn't, as you might suppose, because the stock markets were closed on that day. It was, as he loved to confess, because the offices of the American, the British, and the French occupation authorities were closed that day. He was sure that if he had done it when they were open, they would have countermanded the order. It worked like a charm. Within days, the shops were full of goods. Within months, the German economy was humming along at full steam. Economists weren't surprised at the results. After all, that's what a price system is for. But to the rest of the world, it seemed an economic miracle that a defeated and devastated country could, in little more than a decade, become the strongest economy on the continent of Europe. In a sense, this city, West Berlin, is something of a unique economic test tube, set as it is deep in communist East Germany. Two fundamentally different economic systems collide here in Europe, ours and theirs, separated by political philosophy definitions of freedom and a steel and concrete wall. To digress from inflation, economic freedom does not stand alone. It's part of a wider order. I wanted to show you how much difference it makes by letting you see how the people live on the other side of that Berlin Wall. But the East German authorities wouldn't let us. The people over there speak the same language as the people over here. They have the same culture. They have the same forebears. They are the same people. Yet you don't need me to tell you how differently they live. There is one simple explanation. The political system over there cannot tolerate economic freedom. The political system over here could not exist without it. But political freedom cannot be preserved unless inflation is kept in bounds. That's the responsibility of government which has a monopoly over places like this. The reason we have inflation in the United States, or for that matter, anywhere in the world, is because these pieces of paper and the accompanying book entries, or their counterparts in other nations, are growing more rapidly than the quantity of goods and services produced. The truth is, inflation is made in one place and one place only, here in Washington. This is the only place where there are presses like this that turn out these pieces of paper we call money. This is a place where the power resides to determine how rapidly the amount of money shall increase. What happened to all that noise? That's what would happen to inflation if we stopped letting the amount of money grow so rapidly. This is not a new idea. 
It's not a new cure, it's not a new problem. It's happened over and over again in history. Sometimes inflation has been cured this way on purpose. Sometimes it's happened by accident. During the Civil War, the North, late in the Civil War, overran the place in the South where the printing presses were setting up, where the pieces of paper were being turned out. Prior to that point, the South had had a very rapid inflation. If my memory serves me right, something like 4% a month. It took the Confederacy something over two weeks to find a new place where they could set up their printing presses and start them going again. During that two-week period, inflation came to a halt. After the two-week period, when the presses started running again, inflation started up again. It's that clear, that straightforward. More recently, there's another dramatic example of the only effective way to deal with rampant inflation. In 1973, Japanese housewives going to market were faced with an unpleasant fact. The cash in their purses seemed to be losing its value. Prices were starting to soar as the awful story of inflation began to unfold once again. The Japanese government knew what to do. What's more, they were prepared to do it. When it was all over, Economists were able to record precisely what had happened. In 1971, the quantity of money started to grow more rapidly. As always happens, inflation wasn't affected for a time. But by late 1972, it started to respond. In early 73, the government reacted. It started to cut monetary growth. But inflation continued to soar for a time. The delayed reaction made 1973 a very tough year of recession. Inflation tumbled only when the government demonstrated its determination to keep monetary growth in check. It took five years to squeeze inflation out of the system. Japan had attained relative stability. Unfortunately, there's no way to avoid the difficult road the Japanese had to follow before they could have both low inflation and a healthy economy. First, they had to live through a recession until slow monetary growth had its delayed effect on inflation. Inflation is just like alcoholism. In both cases, when you start drinking or when you start printing too much money, the good effects come first. The bad effects only come later. That's why in both cases there's a strong temptation to overdo it, to drink too much and to print too much money. When it comes to the cure, it's the other way around. When you stop drinking or when you stop printing money, the bad effects come first and the good effects only come later. That's why it's so hard to persist with the cure. In the United States, four times in the 20 years after 1957, we undertook the cure. But each time, we lacked the will to continue. As a result, we had all the bad effects and none of the good effects. Japan, on the other hand, by sticking to a policy of slowing down the printing presses for five years, was, by 1978, able to reap all the benefits. Low inflation and a recovering economy. But there's nothing special about Japan. Every country that has had the courage to persist in a policy of slow monetary growth has been able to cure inflation and at the same time achieve a healthy economy. And here at the Harper Library in the University of Chicago, our distinguished guests have their own ideas, too. So, let's join them now. If you can control the money supply, you can certainly cut back or control the rate of inflation. I'd have to say that uh, that prescription is a little bit easier to write than it is to fill. Uh, I think there are some other ways to do it, and I... Uh, would relate the money supply, I think inflation is a measure of the relationship between money and the goods and services that money is meant to cover.